because you're jumping back into the gap. Outlet to coach, it's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. Lead the country in offensive rebound. Hey coach, welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. Let's share the game. Happy New Year, Coach. Whether you're an old or new fan, thanks for supporting the Basketball Podcast. We look forward to a great 2020. One coach emailed me over the holidays, told me, Coach, we have more wins already than all of last year. Even better, they're against teams we have never beat in the past. All thanks to full basketball immersion, as I like to say. Simply put, basketball immersion has made new to basketball girls into really good basketball players. We have been playing some beautiful basketball which is crazy to think back in March when I was trying to guess where on the schedule we could get a win. Thanks for all you do in sharing the game. Well, I'm grateful for Coach for sharing that, and I look forward to some great success for all of you in 2020. Enjoy the podcast. Coach is a real treat today. Thomas Isalo, a Finnish coach who's coaching in the German Bundesliga, coaching Cryosham Merlins. Did I say that right, Coach? Pretty much. Crowdsaw Merlin. Awesome. And Bundesliga is also known as Easy Credit BBL and a league that I follow a lot. But your club has traditionally been a club that's played in the Pro A League. And since you've been there, you've had success moving it up and competing in the Bundesliga, Coach. Yes, we were able to move up from the Pro A, which is the second Bundesliga in 1718. Last year, we played BBL. Before that, there were also two seasons not so successful. And actually, last season was the first time in the club history that we were able to keep the team in the Bundesliga by sporting results, so to speak. So, And this year, we've been able to have a little bit more success early in the season. Well, it's a great league. I really enjoy watching some real variation in terms of style and how teams play and oh, great success. And I'm looking forward to diving deep with you with a few things. But the thing, and you shared this with me, is that you phrase your overall basketball philosophy and the philosophy that you bring to your team as collective basketball. Can you give us an idea, a definition of what collective basketball is? Well, I think it starts with uh, with defining what basketball is. And I've my friend and mentor, Harari Mannanen, has a phrasing that basketball is interaction or conflict between the two teams within the rules of the game. And already there, you can see that there's no mention of any individual stats or anything like this. It's it's basically two teams, and then they are fighting it out within the rules of the basketball. So for me, everything starts with the collective. Everything starts with the interactions between the players, between coaches and the players, and also interactions between the club. So this may seem somewhat abstract but when you really dig into this this obviously makes sense and the one thing that you've said is there are no actions only interactions can you dive a little bit deeper into what you mean by there's no actions well in the rules of basketball you have to have at least two players in the game for the game to continue so that's already interaction and you need two players if we talk about a common situation like a like a pick a roll you're interacting with your teammates directly in the pick and roll and also with the three other players, but you're also interacting against the other team. And I think that gives me at least a framework that I can use in my daily coaching. So what are some things that we do to cultivate these successful interactions? And really, when we think about it, you're talking about two-player actions, three-player actions. I mean, there's all these interactions in terms of the phrasing that you use. So what are some ways that we cultivate these successful interactions? I think everything starts with the philosophy of understanding that. Then in our position, obviously, we're a professional team. So we try to recruit players who also have similar thoughts about basketball, that they view it as a team game and are willing to do their job within that team, selecting the style of play roles within that system that they are complementary to each other and then obviously training which plays a huge part because obviously the practice is the number one tool of each coach once you have the team together recruiting which applies to a lot of coaches whether it's collegiate level or or the professional level trying to recruit players what 
defines a player when you look at them and say, that is a player that would be successful in our collective basketball philosophy. What do you look for in terms of, is it stats? Is it some type of way that they interact with their teammates, with the game, et cetera? What are some of the specific things that you look for in recruiting? Well, that's obviously a large question. I think, first of all, the process for us goes at least like this, that a lot of times the agents are offering or, or give out some lists of players or, or recommend or we hear from a scout or, or something about a player and then you check the basic statistical profile of the player if that is anywhere close to the level that we're playing at. So we're playing in one of the top leagues in Europe. So already there's a pretty high expectation of having done something if it's at the collegiate level or or as a professional or even in the G League. So that's a big part of it. Then if if you see, okay, that is a, a match or, or can be a match, what I do is I, I hop on Synergy and I, I start watching clips of that specific player. And also what to me is very important is the play types that a lot of times players talked about or advertised as pick the role players, for example, but they have very low usage, for example, in college or, or as a professional. So you see pretty quickly what roles he's been in previously, or if, if he's more of a floor spacer and for big men, you see pretty quickly if he's a post-up guy, if he's just a guy who cleans up, or if he's a role man. If those fit, I think then the whole process gets more interesting and, and also more difficult because then you dive into the the game tape and that's where you see a lot of these, I would say it like uh, in-between moments where does the player change roles? Is he aware all of the time? Does he fall asleep? Does he relax? And I think this is something that you can't find definitely not through highlight tapes or through stats or even on synergy. So you have to look at full games and see if the player can function as a part of that five man collective all the time without relaxing. And if, if that's a positive, then you start talking to, to people who know him, teammates, coaches, et cetera, to find out if the mindset matches the game. So I think there's levels to it. It's great and great to get that context. And I'm wondering, obviously there's going to be a best player on your team, just like on other teams. And when you're talking about this collective mindset, this collective basketball, how does the best player fit in? Do you find that sometimes they struggle with that because there's a certain confidence or a certain positive ego in a player who is a best player? Or do we want them to fit into this collective? I think it's very hard to define who's the best player. I often see that the public or the fans, they gravitate towards the players with the statistics or the most highlight-worthy material, so to speak. But I think coaches have a little bit different viewpoint on who are the best players. To me, that's the player who helps the team win most. And that's not always the guy who who puts up the biggest stats. But it's also about buying into that collective. I have very honest discussions with the players when recruiting them, telling what type of role I envision for them within the team. If I see him as somebody who's an advantage creator, or if I see him as somebody who can utilize advantages created by others. And I think that's an important distinction to make between those two groups of players. Oh, tremendous distinction. And and certainly in the modern game, really important as well in terms of understanding those things. And when you have these discussions with players, how in-depth are you going in terms of explaining the philosophy and explaining the concepts? And are they generally getting it and understanding it? Certainly dealing with professionals, they may have a better understanding of what you're talking about. For the most part, I think those conversations are always pretty positive. Obviously, both parties want to present the best sides from themselves, the player and and also the club. So I talk about the positives of our club and the player talks is very engaged usually in those discussions. And then we might talk about subjects like play types that I've seen the player use or certain actions and, um, and tell him how I envision to use him in our team offense or how defensively I feel like he would fit in and what type of role and what type of system we have. And I usually ended with a question like, does that sound something like that you would want to participate in? And then we talk about the culture that we have. And, and obviously that's not for everybody 
you know, like you said, there are players who maybe feel they need to get more touches or they need to be all the time responsible for creating the assist or basket. And that's not really how we play. So I think it's, but it, it's very important to get it out of the way as soon as possible. So we see if we can move in the same direction. So why is this important? Like, why is this important? Maybe especially relative to your, your smaller budget club. Why is this philosophy important? We are looking for like how we started after we had a very difficult season last year in the Bundesliga. We were the last team to remain in the league, which okay performance from us having the smallest budget in the league. Just like this year, we are in that tier of teams that have had the smallest budget. So we were thinking about the big picture competitive advantages and how you can create them. And money, obviously, the budget plays a big part in this profession. Let's say we have a budget of $3 million, our club, and Bayern Munich has a budget of $23 million. And there are several teams that are more or less over $5 million to about $10 million. So we are midget in this game. And the competitive advantage, you have to find it from somewhere else as, uh, than just pure talent. Because talent is obviously expensive. And players who've produced and who've been successful in leading their teams are very hard for us to come by. We can find those players, but they must come from smaller leagues then, or they must have relative inexperience or so. What I think we can do is that collectively, we can play better basketball. We might not have more talent, but collectively, we can play better basketball if we have functional lineups for 40 minutes. And that means that we are not looking for the best players per se, but rather the right players who have obviously a talent fit because of the level of the league, but also a system and role fit. So I would say that's a huge part. And then I can't stress enough the importance of the mindset of the players. That's also a huge part that we didn't touch on. Well, we can come to that. And just quickly, I mean, you, you said it this way to me, is that being the better collective is realistic and being the higher intensity team is also realistic, but being the most talented team or the highest payroll team is not realistic. So you're really just dealing with realities. Yes. And that's, that's our job. We are not, you know, it's a, it's a very competitive business. All of the coaches in our league are, our high level coaches looking for an edge. And it starts with the idea that the collective basketball idea starts with that, that we have the five we have on the floor, the five players, they can play better basketball than the other five, even though if during the summer or during the spring, during the recruiting period, they would not be as highly regarded by other teams. And that's what it starts with. And Having looked at this league, BBL is an intensive league. To me, it was obvious the conclusions from last year that the teams that were able to overperform were those with a extremely high work rate, really intense basketball. You're getting everything out of the players. There's no relaxing on the floor. And those teams that stick together and play team basketball, even in the difficult situations. So a lot of those underdog teams kind of laid the blueprint also for how we could improve our program. So you talked about mindset and maybe let's start with that you just said is how do we maximize work rate? Like that's what you're saying basically is you don't want many players to take a playoff because we're not talented enough to take a playoff. And this goes against somewhat social norms, which is like, you know, a lot of players can act like they're playing hard, but are they really playing hard? And that's the question. So how are you doing that? How are you maximizing the work rate? Well, you first have to understand if what stage the player is at at his career. I really like the Alba Berlin has a tremendous coach, Coach Aito, who said that he doesn't really categorize players into old or young players, but into players who want to learn new new things or express the things they've already learned. And if you want to play more intense with a higher work rate, the players have to be vulnerable. They have to be willing to accept that they're going to be very tired. And the, the fact that they're going to be out of their comfort zone on a regular basis in the practices, and that's where the growth happens. And that's obviously the head coach's job, especially. 
he is responsible for that, for the intensity that the team plays with. And like you said, it's, it's against the social norms. That's, I think, as a listener of your show, you know, there have been topics about this, but you cannot protect the players. A lot of times the, you end up with soft players if you do that, but you got to be closer to kind of like a panic zone than comfort zone. And I think, you know, a lot of the coaching is kind of can seem to an outsider like nagging, but at the higher level, the differences are very small and the key is to create better habits. Absolutely. And so in terms of challenging them, you're using the the phrase nagging them, but basically you're just, you're just pointing out things that they can do better. Like you're using coaching interventions and is that happening through practice, through film? How are the ways that you're challenging players to be able to, again, get beyond these, these social norms and maximize their work rate? A typical day would be for us would start with a video session. It's usually not very long, could be 10 to 15 minutes. It's focused on usually some type of theme. And for us, we're more concept based on defense. We focus more on the things that we were doing and that we have been practicing. And if it's transferring, if the things we are doing in practice, if it's transferring, and this is obviously not just toward the players, but this is also toward the coaches, for us, very important information, because if it's not transferring, then a lot of the faults is on the coaches and on the practice design, then how can we teach better and, and design the practices for better learning? And then we take it onto the floor and more or less, we might have some themes for the practice, but then we work on our basics within the system pretty similarly every day. But there's obviously variation in how much volume there is, the intensity we try to keep constant, or then have an actual recovery practice. So we try to avoid that working in the in the gray area, so to speak. So when you talk about concepts, you've mentioned this, but like, how much do coaches work on habits? How much do you work on the context of your opponent? Can you get into that a little bit? Like, I'm curious what you mean, especially about, well, let's start with the habit part. Like, what do you mean by how much do you work on habits? What type of habits are we talking about? Well, first of all, habits make or break the player. So we can talk about a habit like, let's take an example. Our defense is a little bit different from maybe the more conservative defenses. So we are an aggressive ball screen defense. And we don't consider any player from one to five being different. So for example, the five in our system is not sitting back. He's not really protecting the paint. And this is a very difficult habit to create with fives who have been before in in systems where they're the primary rim protector, where we expect them to play defense just like guards and be attached to the screener every time, even full court. So this is a, a typical habit. The other one, if we talk about conceptual, I think in in your show, you talked about also with Coach Fern, for example, about tagging up. That's also a habit that you're looking to create for the players of going every time, tagging up on your player. And this is what I mean with habits. About the concepts and context, I think that's something that every coach more or less struggles. I played a few years in the Finnish national team, and we had a very specific style, very aggressive style. And I know it was always kind of uh, difficult to choose, okay, are we working against the opposition defense or our own defense? Because more or less the reps you do, like a drop coverage or a zone or anything like this, they can set your habits back in your own concepts. So there's a certain trade-off, but you also cannot go into the game unprepared. And for us, we've chosen much more concept-oriented then context oriented. This is also something where I made a sort of a philosophical change as I've gotten more experience as a coach. I don't know if it's going to continue in that direction, but at the moment, it seems to be more natural to me. So in this sense, does collective mean equal? And I assume not, even though you gave that example of your five playing ball screen coverage the same as your one, two, three, four. But we're not talking about equal. 
are we trying to treat them equal, but then there's still these roles that you're defining, right? I don't think the players are equal in terms of their basketball skills or anything like that. As people, yes, they are equal, but that doesn't mean that you treat everybody the same. So that's that's how I would I would probably phrase it. But like I said, there needs to be a clear understanding of if we talk about offensive game, who are the primary ball handlers, who are the primary guys to create the advantage for other guys to use, and the players need to obviously accept that. So give us a context to how you play offense then in terms of, give us a real example of what you mean by collective basketball on offense. Well, we can take maybe the most common thing in, in modern basketball, which is pick and roll. So it's uh, very much a five-man game. It's definitely not a two-man game. For most most players in the BBL, it's a three- or four-man game at its best, how they can make reads as creators. But what we try to do is we try to have roles for every player in different spacing that we play out of and patterns of movement that we practice and, and that everybody plays a part. And if everybody is doing their job, okay, things will more or less work, starting with recognizing the coverage, because you have to first, obviously, and that brings us back to the context part that you have to have solutions for different type of defenses and you need a collective recognition of that. So all five players need to see the same thing and then be able to react to it. So an example would be versus uh, aggressive coverage, your players would be looking for these possible solutions and versus less aggressive, they'd be looking for these solutions. And these are something that you practice daily out of, do you run sets or is it just concepts that flow? Yes, we run set plays very much on offense. We have a certain progression that the ball handlers go through depending on how the previous possession ended. If we are looking for a fast break or early offense opportunity, or if we set it up. But like you said, against aggressive coverages, the team reaction is completely opposite from maybe a more conservative. If we compare like an aggressive show defense versus a drop coverage. So for us, we try to create simple rules that give uh, guidelines to the players, but don't really constrict them. So let's say out of uh, aggressive ball screen coverage, what we want to do is we want to move the ball early. So we want to move the ball early and twice. So two passes against the aggressive coverage. As soon as we have two guys engaged on the ball, we want to move it. And that to me is the simplest form of of advantages, which is the numbers advantage. So for a short period of time, you're playing four against three, or even in some cases, if you can isolate like one more guy with your spacing, you can play three against two. And this is obviously a huge advantage. And then the players uh, need to understand what to do and, and how to move in that. If you're playing against drop, it's very different because then the ball handler must be much more aggressive, provoke the defense. The five men's angle of the role is different. And what we talk about with the three shooters, uh, we've also there, we try to use a pretty simple distinction that they should recognize if the ball handler needs face or if he needs support. So against aggressive coverages, We want to provide at least two open passing lanes, so the ball handler needs support. Against more conservative coverages, we talk about spacing because that's what the ball handler needs to be able to create something for his teammates or for himself. So those are concrete examples. That's awesome. And so what I'm imagining in picturing this is that practice is an enjoyable space to be in. If you build this collective mindset amongst your players that they enjoy it because they're active participants in each other's development, but they also feel that they're getting better through that. Is that a fair comment that it would be like in the ideal situation, practice is enjoyable because of this collective basketball mindset? More or less. I think there are, I played professionally and I can say like every day wasn't enjoyable, but the process as a whole is. and. You need to accept that there are some things that everyone must do 
even if they don't like to do because this is a team and we have certain rules and it's part of the collective philosophy that there are some things that everybody has to do and it's not always pleasant but i think the joy comes during game day and during when you see that those things are actually working and that's that's something that also pushes you want to improve and in that regard we have a very fortunate situation and we did a really good job with our recruiting this year that we have a bunch of guys who really want to improve and move forward in their careers they're about the same age so between 22 to 27 and they like to spend time also off the court together but they are able to still to push each other and to compete so they understand this difference and yeah i think it's a complex topic to get into but i think it's definitely enjoyable every time you're really focused and you immerse yourself in something that you want to learn something new well you already went where i was going which is there's obviously outliers to this to this that there's always moments whether it's just individual moments within practice or within the team or obviously just individuals that don't completely buy in right away to this and i was going to ask you how you handle some of those outliers in terms of not buying in right away and how are you bringing them on board? How are you selling them? Or do we just remove them? Because that's the easiest thing to do at the professional level. I have to mention here that it's, it's not always the easiest thing at the professional level. We have uh, full year contracts. They're guaranteed contracts. So there might be a tryout period. But if at a later stage you feel like this player might not fit into the team as well as you thought, you know you're still liable to pay for the whole salary unless you can talk to the player and, and negotiate it. But that's beside the point. But there's always, I think that's more of the norm. You know, you're not going to have a team where you have 10 or 12 guys who are all immediately have the buy-in, but they need to see that the things are working. They obviously are going to measure, are we going to get to our goals that we set for the team? And do we have good enough players? How do I measure up? It does the coach know what he is doing? And I think this is a much longer process than maybe people think. With And I think it's somewhat, it's kind of the like highest definition of teamwork to have that triangle of the, the three parties, you know, that the players are A, they're trusting themselves, then B, they're trusting their teammates, and C, they're trusting the coach, which basically is trusting the system. And I think this takes a long time and, and we've been very fortunate that we've been able to get this buy-in and this, what I call, if you have these three, what I call collective confidence, that we've been able to get it early. And that speaks volumes about the character of our guys. It's great. It's, it's really fascinating stuff. And another thing that you've mentioned to me that ever since really the podcast, this has been sticking with me more and more. And I don't think I fully did it the way I would now if I was back coaching and this concept of reverse engineering offense that's starting with the end in mind. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think, again, this is a way like we all can find plays, but can we talk about the play after the play or what happens when it doesn't work? Or even as you said, within concepts, this concept of what are we doing on offense? Yeah. So reverse engineering is something that in the, especially in the past few years, we've been doing more and more. So we kind of take the end point at the offense, you know, a certain like sticking point. Okay. What could be the last sticking point? And then for me, we are mostly a, a pick and roll offense looking to create advantages, looking to create closeouts. So to me, closeout decisions were the logical starting point because that's usually the ending point of a lot of offenses or where the hiccups happen. So if you want to play what we term 0.5 basketball, the closeout decisions play obviously a huge part. You can have five, six, even seven at our level in one possession before you can unravel the defense. So this is something we start to work on from the first day of preseason. And it also gives context to the players of what we can expect, how we're going to play, and it pushes them immediately out of the comfort zone because. In our practices, when we run the 0.5 drills, for example, you know, if the offense loses the advantage or doesn't make a quick decision, it's a lot of times we call it a turnover through our rules of the game. 
So we are really pushing them to make quick decisions in the beginning, even if it's the wrong decision. But we want to really push them in that direction. And from there, we move on to what we call our drive and kick game, which is basically we're talking about penetration automatics. So when the ball is being driven in a certain direction, what is the role of the other four players? How do they need to move? How do they need to react? And and this is something that you need to brush up on consistently throughout the season. That's one of the habits that's really hard to create, especially for young guards who are used to being on the ball a lot. The off-ball movement, which I think makes up a good offense and having a system and then being able to kind of stay in the flow of the offense so not to relax, which is typical. You know, you create an advantage. You don't think it's going to come to the fourth or fifth closeout and then you see, oh, now I'm in the wrong spot. Okay. From that, from the penetration automatics, we move on in the preseason to interactions. So with us, it's a lot of, we start with a certain spacing on the floor. Let's say it can be an angled pick spacing. So going to the two sides with one lift that we call, and we start to work from this against different type of coverages. And then we might work another spacing, which might be top spacing or empty side pick and roll spacings. And only after that, and we might go to the first practice games. You know, we play usually our first practice game after two weeks without ever really having plays, but just having played out of, out of a certain spacing. And this is one where we also use our early offense as a teaching tool because it combines these three uh, different spacings and there's opportunities to get us into the driving kick even earlier than that. So, so that's what I mean with the, with the reverse engineering, that every time we kind of add a layer and then in the end, once we put the entry in, which could be like a diamond entry or a Iverson cut or a horns entry, we are already familiar with what happens after that. Yeah, it's great stuff. And I love that thinking. And I think it's it's so much more impactful for players in terms of understanding how to play. And then clearly in my wheelhouse, which is decision-making. Can you talk about the decision-making cycle? That's how you phrase it? Yes. That's something I started doing this year. I read a year ago about a book about John Boyd, who's been quoted also in, in different type of coaching books or but he was a military fighter and he talked talked about the decision making cycle and the the OODA loop and and how to get inside that of the enemy and i everything boils down to to basically that speed is the thing that we're looking at so it's very hard to beat a team that's faster okay and you it's also very very easy to understand it incorrectly so i'm not talking about you know all out running speed i'm talking more about the teamwork the speed of the teamwork the speed of the decision that the decisions happen first in the players minds and that they know they're faster to let's say our team gets into rotations defensively that we are better in our rotations we're faster in our rotations than the other team is in their driving kick or or respacing or whatever you want to call it and vice versa that we are able to keep making 0.5 decisions against the rotating defense. And I think this is the key once you have the advantage. And and that to me is getting inside the decision-making cycle of the opponent that we are always one step ahead. I think this is where you find surprising differences also between players. And it comes back to the recruiting that not all players can do this, stay engaged for the whole 24 seconds on offense or defense. They have very different levels of awareness that don't really come out from their statistics or something that they've done. So that's definitely something you can think about through offense or defense, or even in one of the key moments, which is the transitions to both ends. We talk about it as role change. And a lot of coaches talk about, you know, first three steps. So do we. But when do those first three steps happen? How small is the lag? between when the ball changes possession or are you able to anticipate it's also the speed of the decision making yeah i like that role change uh, role change for sure it happens throughout a game in terms of those things so 
when you're talking about closeout decisions and penetration automatics and then decision making cycle, what does a practice look like in terms of these interactions? Are we primarily offense versus defense? We do some on air. What does a practice look like in terms of building these things? I think we do, like we were talking about this with my brother, who's also my assistant coach. This year, we were talking that it's changing throughout the season. I think the level of the challenge needs to go up. You need to constantly challenge the players. You can't get let them get comfortable in the in the drills we do. In the beginning, we do the teaching against zeros, which I'm not a huge fan of, but it just happens to be a little bit more convenient and you can spend one of the practices during the day so you don't have to get the players taped up when there's no contact. We might provide guided defense for context for the players if we feel like they're not they don't understand like what this ties into in the bigger picture. We try to break it down as a as a whole that they have an understanding of why we are doing this and why it's important or in the in the bigger picture how it ties into that. But then we do it with small sided games. I think three on three is already pretty high level of complexity. You have teammates, you have opponents, and it's very important in basketball to always react to the, and in all of the invasion sports, to react to the players that are closest to you. And I think three on three is already very close to realism with the five on five. Obviously, there's space considerations on the floor, there's more space, but that might actually make some concepts easier to teach and get through when they see this. So we try to adjust the complexity that it fits the team and that it provides a challenge for them, but it's still learnable. It's good. And I guess the next obvious question about offense is shot selection and this concept and this collective basketball philosophy of how do you define shot selection for your players? Well, we look to aim for roughly a 60% effective field goal, I would call it. So six out of 10 twos or six out of 10 free throws or, or four out of 10 three pointers. I think that's a good baseline. There's not a lot of teams that, that have that type of effective field goal throughout the season, but that should be the goal of the offense to create this type of shots. And that gives something, you know, you can talk to, especially young guys that are coming into the team and you're, you can ask them, you know, when they take a specific shot, like, do you think you can make this shot six out of 10? And of course, if they're confident, like most athletes are, they will tell, of course I can. And then You can go after practice and you can check out on Synergy and you can show that the best players in the BBL make 37% of this shot. And you can this way, I think, create understanding of what a good shot is and when that good shot is because it also shifts. The concept of a good shot shifts during the possession. It's not the same in the first seconds as it is in the last seconds where you you obviously need to get some type of a, a shot off. I think we play, but it all comes back to creating the advantages. And for us, the thing I think we do a little bit differently is we don't really run like throughout the reverse engineering process. We are encouraging the players to look for those advantages as soon as possible. So if we can find it out of early offense or fast break, great. Okay, let's take the shot. And this is part of what we think of our as our competitive advantage that we are more used to playing at a higher pace than the opposition and it's our environment and we are dictating it and i think we as a whole we for some reason we end up shooting more threes (laughs) than the other teams maybe it's the reliance on the driving kick maybe it's the spacing we play with which is perimeter oriented we try to keep the pain open but yeah at the moment we have a relatively high effective field goal. I think it's around 56, which is good in the BBL. It's not great. And we have the highest three-point rate, I believe, or at least most made threes with 12 and a half per game, which would, if we're able to maintain it, actually set a new BBL record. So that also has to do with the trends of the game and, and BBL, but it's almost half of our field goal. So generally, I think the three-pointers, if you can create catch-and-shoot shots, open catch and shoot shots, they tend to take you closer to that 60% than away from it. Super stuff. 
Coach, I guess the next question might be, other than your team, is there a team to watch, maybe role model team to watch that would best show us what collective basketball is? Well, I think if you can if you can find uh, videos of the Argentina national team in the in the World Cups this summer or fall, I was really impressed by their game and and how they to me embodied being a team. They were all the time against some of the best teams in the world. They were seemed all the time one step ahead. They had very clear roles. They had three very high level creators in the backcourt. They had modern combo wings uh, that had length and were able to play multi-positional defense. And then obviously the experienced Luis Scola was the was sort of an X factor for that team. But I really enjoyed watching that team. And to me, it's, it looked like watching basketball from the future, from all of the topics that we've covered so far. And, and I think that was, you know, it was more about the fit than the raw talent compared to a lot of other teams. So I think that's a good, really good team to look at. But there's, I think, several teams in our league and also in Europe that are, that are really worth watching. Oh, no question. And uh, that's a great example. They were so much fun to watch. And you can kind of get that view of what collective basketball is by picturing them for sure. I mentioned already the diversity in the BBL in terms of the different styles of play. And I didn't know this until you told me that 11 of 17 coaches are foreigners. And that's that's kind of unique for one of these foreign leagues, right? Yes, I, I think that's a complete outlier within the big leagues in Europe. So Spain, Italy, France, if I'm not mistaken, Greece, those are much more. Uh, you have national coaches in those leagues. And I think, obviously, you know, I like this. It has given me a chance also to coach at this level. But I like the influence of the different styles of basketball and how they mix. And when, to me, you know, innovation happens when you combine different concepts. So you bring in, we have two excellent Spanish coaches in the league and you, you combine that with something from the Balkans or or maybe something from a Scandinavian coach, and, and you can have combinations that maybe people didn't think about before. And the, you can also, you know, look at other team sports also for this type of combinations and try to try to bring those concepts to life on the basketball floor. Well, and, and that's another thing to get into a little bit, and I hopefully you can shed some light on this because I've been trying to ask coaches a little bit of some of the trends in the different leagues and. I know that John Patrick in your league is a little bit unique in the sense that he presses and that doesn't happen as much at the professional level. But what are some other things that you see in terms of your league as trends? Well, I definitely think of a uh, three-point shooting rate. I think in the BBL is, is currently over 42, at least was a little while ago. So that's highest of all the, all the big leagues in Europe. And, and that's uh, where... In the past, ACB of Spain has been kind of uh, blazing the trail for all the other leagues and, and where that to me is one component of, of, of modern basketball. And it's definitely a trend in the NBA. There's no doubt about that. That's something that's also maybe ties into the fact that the BBL teams, even though they are very good teams, they're not really teams that on average can compete money wise to the biggest clubs in Europe and the skilled big guys are obviously most expensive players. So a lot of teams here, like you pointed out, coach John Patrick from Ludwigsburg, like he has played with, uh, I think what he calls guard terror, where he plays with four guards and very difficult to contain on offense because of the spacing it provides and the skill. And then when you combine that with another trend, that's in BBL, which is the pressing. I think that's one of those unique combinations. And Ludwigsburg is doing that again. I think they're tops in Europe in press percentage, close to 30% of possessions. And we are at the moment, we are second, second or third in the Bundesliga, but around 21, 22%. And we've tried to figure out ways how we can increase that percentage. And that's a uh, one of those ideas came through actually your podcast and listening to 
uh, listening to the episodes with Coach Pannone and Coach Fern about the tagging up concept. And uh, I like the concept. And obviously, you always got to review that if that's something that fits to the style of play. But what I saw in that was a chance to have more press possessions because you're actually matched up with those guys right away after the rebound. So you don't need a inbound or, or a dead ball situation to create the press. So so I think this way you can you can kind of neatly combine different concepts. Then I think big one that certainly has a Spanish influence in it is uh, the aggressive pick and roll defenses that Coach Aito and and Alba Berlin started doing. I think it was uh, two or three years ago, and have been very successful two times in the finals, consecutive times with a very young team and. They do an incredible job of playing with enthusiasm and and an activity that's uh, very hard to very hard to capture or imitate. Been very impressed with that, and that has also spread throughout the league. So we have another Spanish coach, Coach Pedro Callas, who also last year led his Feta team to a really tremendous performance and to fourth place as a coming up with us from the Pro A by by taking that to another level still the the defensive intensity and the and the pressing and uh, hedging in the ball screens and they were really inside your decision making cycle all of the time so so i think that's also one of those teams that a lot of people who follow basketball can check where the future of basketball is going so i would at least say those those three things that are if not unique that are definitely trends I love it. And so many great insights, Coach, throughout the podcast. And what obviously we're learning is there's just so many great deep thinkers of the game, and you're one of them for sure. So thanks for taking the time and sharing the game with us, Coach. I really appreciate it. It was definitely a joyful experience. Thank you. To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations. So connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballimmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there and share the game.